Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Music in the Last Days uh, seminar. We're here at session number three, and we've been having quite a time already. So uh, the title of, of this session is Form, Style, and the Problem of the Drum Set. Let's have a word of prayer as we move on. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift of music that you have given to us. And we pray that you will illuminate our minds so that we can understand how to worship and praise your holy name. So change our hearts, change our taste buds, help us to become in line with your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This comes from one of our uh, publications, and I don't have the source up there right now, but I would like to read it so that we can concentrate simply on the content and analyze it as it relates to the question of forms and styles. It says, a style is not a moral standard or ethical principle, but simply a way of doing things that expresses preferences and individuality. But back to worship styles, because they are not an issue of right and wrong, right or wrong, according to this publication, it is possible with any style of worship to have a lively, growing fellowship or a stagnant, lifeless one, just as it is possible to dress a living person or a corpse in a three-piece suit or jogging clothes. Here's the clincher. The spirit of life and creativity, the Holy Spirit makes the difference here. According to what we've just read, the Holy Spirit can bring life to any worship style. The difference is whether we're doing it in a lifeless way or in an energetic way, that makes the difference for those who wrote this article up here. The question now is what is ultimately at stake when we begin to try new styles and forms of worship? What is involved in this revitalizing process? Very insightfully, the article goes on to inform you and I of what's actually at stake when we begin to tinker with the forms. It says revitalizing church programs means in some way revitalizing the church itself. It calls members to move out of the spiritual comfort zone and follow God by faith into new territory. New territory may mean, now notice this, re-examining long-held notions about who God is, what God is like, and the family members that fit into God's house. So when we talk about revitalizing, when we talk about changing forms and styles, they're letting us know that we might have to revamp our ideas about what God is like. That's ultimately at stake here. New territory may mean following the biblical command to enlarge the place of thy tent, to broaden our affections, tolerance, and outreach, to include many different kinds of people with many different ways of viewing God and the world as valuable contributing members of our fellowship. New territory may mean trying new styles and forms of worship or at least making them available to other people. Now, they didn't really explain what they meant when they said many different ways of viewing God. Does that mean different as contradictory or different as complementary? And there's a big difference. Does it really mean that we can actually coexist side by side and have completely contradictory views of God and, and, and we're all one big happy family? But at least we can understand from this article that there's more at stake than just some cosmetic changes. It's re-examining our whole concept of God which worship is based upon. Now the question is, as we take a look at the scripture, are styles and forms neutral? If you take a look closely at the first two commandments, we can have our answer. The first commandment prohibits the worship of false gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment prohibits the worship of the true God with false forms. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And he goes on in that commandment. He said, not to have any gods before me. Now, when I came to Goebbels yesterday, actually, Goebbels represented a destination for me. Each and every one of us live by some principle, and the first commandment addresses that. Whether it's the God of heaven, whether our God is music, whether our God is money or fame or power, each and every one of us live by some principle that we 
that, that, that is placed ahead of us. Now, when I came to Goebbels, Goebbels was, let's say, I'm directly south of, of Ionia. Had to go a little bit west, but mostly south. Goebbels was my destination. Once I picked my destination, the road that I travel on is pretty much predetermined. I can't just go on, on, uh, on 196 and continue to go south or, or, take some, or, or take 131, I should say, and go north and say, eventually, I'm going to get to Goebbels. No matter how sincere I am, no matter how well-meaning I am, I will not get there. Unfortunately, in, the, in a spiritual sense, many people have come to believe that the form really doesn't matter as long as I'm sincere from the heart and I'm doing it sincerely, it, the form doesn't matter. That's a lot like saying I can take 131 and go north and eventually get the Goebbels. It's just not going to happen. So the second commandment then places a restriction on the forms of worship that we use. It places limits on our creativity. Why? Because if we go outside those limits, we're not going to reach our destination. And that's God himself. It's just not going to happen. There are other models. Very early in human history, we had a problem and a conflict with worship. Cain and Abel. They had the same parents, had the same opportunities, the same privileges. They even worshipped. One brought something that God approved of, the other didn't. An offering of the fruit of the ground, a thank offering, an offering for which there was no blood mingled in that sacrifice. It was a Christless offering. It didn't represent God. God approved of one, but not of the other. Sincerity would not be enough for Cain. He needed something more than that. We need both, friends. We need sincerity and we need truth. And that's what Jesus talked about. Well, there's the example of the golden calf and many other examples. And God did not accept that as a form of worship. That was not acceptable to him, no matter what kind of sincerity the people might have professed. Do you know the story of Nadab and Abihu found in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2? These two men, sons of Aaron, were privileged to see God on the mountain. They were among the 70 elders that saw the glory of God. One day, after drinking some intoxicating wine, they began to reason among themselves and say, well, fire is fire. God only wanted the things in the sanctuary lit with sacred fire and not common fire. But they began to reason among themselves after the influence of alcohol that, well, this, there's really no difference between that fire and that fire. And when they offered the common fire, they were punished immediately. Swift judgment came from the Lord and executed them. Why? Because they were not representing him. It's very dangerous to mess with the things that God has set up. You know, electricity is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, whether you're ignorant, or whether you have a, a lot of knowledge. I saw my son going in one of these outlets one day with a, you know, with a piece of wire, and he was, you know, he was sticking that in there, and, you know, that's dangerous, no matter how young or old or ignorant you are. When we mess with something that is holy, we're on very dangerous ground. The Holy Spirit himself works under the methods that he has set up. He doesn't contradict himself. The method used reflects upon the principle that actuated it. People today say, well, it's the principle that's important. The methods don't really matter. That's like saying, again, I can take 131 north and head to Goebbels because the road I travel, the forms of worship I use don't really matter. We're all worshiping the same God anyhow. Methods cannot be divorced from the principles that actuate them. I did a little study in the book Prophets and Kings on forms of worship and discovered something very interesting. The king's bold defiance of God, this is talking about Jeroboam commenting on the situation in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25 to the end of the chapter. The king's bold defiance of God in thus setting aside divinely appointed institutions was not allowed to pass unrebuked. Even while he was officiating and burning incense during the dedication of the strange altar, 
he had set up at Bethel, there appeared before him a man of God from the kingdom of Judah sent to denounce him for presuming to introduce new forms of worship. It goes on. That was page 101. Vain had been Jeroboam's effort to invest with solemnity the dedication of a strange altar, respect for which would have led to disrespect for the worship of Jehovah in the temple at Jerusalem. By the message of the prophet, the king of Israel should have been led to repent and to renounce his wicked purposes, which were turning the people away from the true worship of God. Prophets and Kings, page 101 and 102. If we take it upon ourselves to, to introduce something new that contradicts something that has already been established, the end result, according to that passage, is that people are going to be turned away from the true worship of God. Here's another example here. Against the marked oppression, the flagrant injustice, the unwanted luxury and extravagance, the shameless feasting and drunkenness, the gross licentiousness and debauchery of their age, the prophets lifted their voices, but in vain were their protests, in vain their denunciations of sin. Him that rebuketh in the gate declared Amos they hate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Now that's a pretty miserable situation, isn't it? Such were some of the results that had followed the setting up of the two calves of gold by Jeroboam. The first departure from established forms of worship had led to the introduction of grosser forms of idolatry until finally nearly all the inhabitants of the land had given themselves over to the alluring practices of nature worship. That deplorable situation was caused by Jeroboam instituting those forms of worship. And whatever was dedicated to the sun and the worship of the earth led back to nature worship as well. The people started to worship nature. Prophets and Kings, page 2, 82. Now, I know whenever we talk about music and worship, the issue of culture can be a very sensitive one. Now, in a previous session, we talked about the fact that we're living in the postmodern world. And what that simply means is that there is no such thing as absolute truth for some people. Truth is simply in the eye of the beholder. So stealing might be right for me, but it's, it's wrong for you. And those are the kinds of things that people say. Now, I want you to think about something here for a minute. If there is no such thing as absolute truth, then there's no way that God can choose the Israelites to tell the truth about himself. That's pretty arrogant, that he would choose one nation. Similarly, we can make the same judgment about the church today. It's, it's kind of arrogant to say that God has called one movement in order to educate people about himself. It's arrogant. Now, if we accept no absolute truth as a definition of what truth is, there's no such thing as false worship. Now, in some of our churches, we have several different worship services, not because we're necessarily bursting at the seams, but we want to provide a worship service for the old people, and then we want to provide one for the young people, and then we can, you know, we want to provide one for uh, the, our, our Filipino brethren, and then our African-American brethren, and then our Chinese brethren. And so we doctor up a different order of service and a different worship style for each and every culture. Could it be that perhaps some of the philosophy that's undergirding this is this postmodern philosophy? I thought the everlasting gospel was supposed to unite each and every one of us. Instead, marketing strategies taken from Fifth Avenue and other places, are being incorporated in the church in order to target certain people. And so, what do we do? We change the doctrine of our worship in order to suit those needs and don't realize that sometimes we're preaching contradictory messages about the God we worship. Something for you to think about. The end result? That we're living in the time of the judges. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. And once we get to that point, it's time for Jesus to come. No question about it. Let's talk about culture a little bit more. I want you to pretend that you were an Egyptian 
and you saw Moses coming down from the mountain, and he took those tablets of stone and just smashed them. Furthermore, he ground that calf into powder and even made you drink it. Now, what do you think Moses or God is going to think if you say, now, wait a minute, Moses, I was an Egyptian, and my father before me was an Egyptian, and, and my grandfather was an Egyptian, and so forth and so on, and we've come here praising God the only way we know how, and now you're telling me that that's not good enough? You're saying that my Egyptian culture uh, it was not good enough to praise God with? You see, friends, the problem, if we make culture the very foundation of our worship, is this. Culture assumes things about God. It assumes things about how he acts that are either biblical or, or they're not. Egyptian culture obviously made a lot of assumptions that were, not, that were unbiblical. So to say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in this worship style simply because that's the way my culture used to do things or does things without critically examining the presuppositions that are involved, the philosophies and the theologies are involved, is very dangerous. And it will never unite the church. Or, what if you were a Moabite? And that worship service was condemned by God as well. Could you really say, well, I'm offended because... You know, I'm a Moabite, and this is how we worship, and my grandfather was a Moabite, and so forth and so on. I don't think God would really, uh, I don't think he's going to say, yeah, you got a point there. Or what if you were a Babylonian? It's said at the sound of the music in Daniel chapter 3, you're to bow down and worship the golden image. Now, what would God think if you, if, if you told him that you were a Babylonian and you're offended because he didn't like your music? Or he didn't think that it represented him? The only point I'm trying to make here is that if you're going to defend your music style by your culture, you better think and examine what elements from your culture are in harmony with the Scripture and what are not. I'm not saying that everything that any culture incorporates is anti-biblical. But we do need to think seriously about this. If you do not choose concrete as your foundation, but you choose styrofoam, and you want to build something on top of that, you're in deep trouble. That's all I'm trying to say. Or the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. She said, you know, uh, our fathers worshipped here on this mountain. And Jesus said, you know what? Your fathers, you know, you don't even know what you worship." Worship is, uh, the true worship is of the Jews and has been given to the Jews. She couldn't defend her Samaritan worship based on her heritage because God had delivered to the Israelites the true principles. Notice with me in Romans chapter 9, verse 3 and 4. It makes it very clear. Romans chapter 9, in verse 3 and 4, it says, Paul says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as Christ concerning the flesh uh, came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. In other words, he didn't give the adoption and the glory and the covenants to the Babylonians and the Moabites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and everybody else. He gave them to the Israelites. It was their job to share them with the whole world. Just like it's our job to preach the everlasting gospel to the whole world. Now, a lot of people say today, well, what about Martin Luther? Did he not take regular barroom melodies and preach the gospel with them? Well, let's analyze this argument a little closer. According to the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, Volume 1, 5th edition, page 848. Now, by the way, that's like quoting the Bible to a bunch of musicians. When you say that, well, this source comes from the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, that settles it. That's like Christians saying, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Here's what they say. A difference in style between sacred and secular music hardly existed in Luther's day. So if you were to live in Luther's time and turn the radio on, listen to that, and then turn the church radio on, you'd say, hmm, not much difference here. That's not true today, as you and I understand. 
So we simply, we cannot use this as a justification to say, well, Luther did it, so let me go ahead and do it. It assumes way too much. Dr. Johansson, in his book, Music and Ministry, page 50, said this, the secular music of our day and the secular music of Luther's day is as different as night is from day. Of the 37 chorales, only one tune came directly from a secular folk song. Even that one tune borrowed from a folk song which appeared in Luther's hymnal of 1535 was later replaced by another melody in the 1539 songbook. Historians believe that Luther discarded it because people associated it with its previous secular text, Ul Ulrich Leopold, Learning from Luther, Some Observations on Luther's Hymns, Journal of Church Music, Volume 8, page 5. Another thing that Luther did was that he derhythmed um, the music and arranged it in four-part harmony. How many rock songs have you heard in four-part harmony? Most of them, sad to say, rock has greatly degenerated as far as its musical ability is concerned. I, I don't even know if they're able to sing in four-part harmony. And that's not really very easy to do. And so if you, you de-rhythm something and arrange it in four-part harmony, you can keep the melody as the same, but believe me, you've really changed the song. And if you still think it's the words that got you, well, my wife can do that. We can keep the melody. I'll de-rhythm it. She'll rearrange it, four-part harmony, and see if you like it. Now, let's switch to the problem of the drum set. Drums and percussion are inseparable in the minds of most people, which leads to great confusion. I had to just clear up something here earlier today. Since the Bible mentions tabrets, timbrels, and all types of cymbals, you can find that in Psalm 150, why not use the drum set? You know, praise them with the high-sounding cymbals, with the low-sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, which is basically what you find in Psalm 149 and 150. So, well, you got some cymbals there, and that has breath, so why not praise the Lord with that? That's kind of how the line of reasoning goes. Well, is David really contradicting himself? You see, there were only four instruments that were allowed in the temple service. They were trumpets, cymbals, lyre and harp. Both of the latter two are stringed instruments. You can find that in 1 Chronicles 15, 16, 16, 5 and 6, 23, verse 5, and 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 6. Those were the only instruments that were allowed in the Hebrew temple worship service. Not only that, this restriction on the instruments was meant to be binding. About 300 years after David, Hezekiah had begun his reformation. Interestingly enough, he first started it by cleansing the sanctuary. Does that ring a bell to Seventh-day Adventists here today? The cleansing of the sanctuary? Do you know what happens when the sanctuary gets cleansed? When it got cleansed there, there was a musical reformation. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. It says, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and with harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The arrangement of the instruments in the Hebrew worship service, in the temple worship service, could not be attributed simply to Hebrew culture. It says, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. These instruments were placed there by divine direction. And there was a great reason for that. So 300 years after David, when there was a revival and reformation, they went back to the instruments of David. Now, turn with me to, to uh, Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27 and 36. 300 years after Hezekiah, in Nehemiah's day, in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, there was a tremendous revival and a reformation. Interestingly enough, after the sanctuary was cleansed in Nehemiah's day, there was a musical reformation. 
Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27, it says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing and with sol, uh, cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. Verse 36, And his brethren, I'm going to skip all their names, and Judah, Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe before them. This is very significant for us as Seventh-day Adventists because we are called the repairers of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. That theme is taken from the revival and reformation that happened in the days of Nehemiah. And if they had a reformation not only in marriage, but in Sabbath keeping and in tithes and offerings, they had a reformation in music as well. And so, if we are to complete the reformation, we must continue on and get back to the instruments of David. Now, what do I mean by that? Does that mean we've got to get rid of some of these instruments and bring back trumpets and lyres and harps? The greater question is, why were those instruments included and others discarded? The reason for it is that the, 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 the lyres and the harps had a great capacity when it came to melodic and melody and harmony, I should say. The trumpets and the cymbals we're, we're going to find were sounders. You might be thinking, well, aha, Pastor, you know, it does say cymbal, and drums do have cymbals, so why not use them? Well, let's figure out how the cymbals were used in the temple services. This is a doctoral dissertation. It says the cymbals were not used by the pre-cantor to conduct the singing by beating out the rhythm of the song or a stanza in the song, but rather to announce the beginning of the song or stanza in the song. Since they were used to introduce the song, they were wielded by the head of choir on ordinary occasions or by the three heads of the guilds on extraordinary occasions. Since the trumpets and cymbals were played together to announce the beginning of the song, the players of both are called the sounder in 1 Chronicles 16, 42. That's John Kleining's dissertation, page 82 and 83. Now, let me just go down to demonstrate this for a minute here. I didn't spend 10 years of my life to learn how to do this. But that's what the Bible says they did. They were sounders. The cymbals and the trumpets sounded together. I didn't spend all that training to do this. That's not how a rock drummer plays the cymbals or the drum set. They really drive the cymbals and the drum set. Uh, so it ends up sounding, you know, a little bit like this. I apologize for those of you that are sitting in the front row, but here we go. That's how a rock drummer plays the cymbals. They bang it. That is not how they played it back then. So we really can't use that as a justification for bringing in the whole drum set into the church because they were not played in the same way at all. Is there a distinction between the drum set and percussion? Now, if you haven't spent a lot of time around drum sets and you haven't really spent a lot of time around music, you might think that a drum is a drum is a drum. And what's the difference? There's tabrets in the, in, in the Old Testament. These are drums too. Why not use them? Well, there is a distinction between the drum set and percussion. They come from two different families and they differ in the way that they are played. This is common knowledge among all drummers and percussionists. A good percussionist does not necessarily make a good drummer. They're, they usually work with their hands. They play snare drums, they play other uh, timpanis and other bigger drums or cymbals. But the drummer sits down with all four of his limbs and plays at the same time. That's like saying, well, you're a violinist, so you should be able to play the cello since it's a stringed instrument. Now, all violinists and cellists understand that that's not true. There's a big difference. So we cannot simply say that a drum is a drum is a drum. No, not at all. The drum set, the trap set, is a modern invention used to accompany jazz and rock. Now, even when the drum set is used to accompany an orchestra, 
the music has been transformed to rock. Because if the drum set is being played the way it was designed to be played, that is exactly what you have. Here's the testimony of a drummer. I am sure we're all familiar with the trap set. That's that right there. And that's the reason for why I bring it, to demonstrate the fact that when you put it together, like the way I've got it together right there, you're strictly limited to rock and jazz. That's it. If you're playing it the way it was designed to be played. I'm sure we're all familiar with the trap set through its use in jazz and rock music, even though the traps are the new kids on the block. The trap drums are not only unique in their construction, but also in how they are played. Each trap drummer is required to be virtually a one-man band of percussive sounds. And this demands of him being able to split his attention evenly between both feet and both hands, as well as the music of which he is a part. This alone is a skill in itself not found among most percussionists and usually takes years of training to develop. So a percussionist is going to work with his hands. A drummer works with all his limbs. So percussionists can do, you know, Uh, they can play this. But a drummer has got to use all limbs at the same time. There's the right foot that's going. There's the right hand, you know. You're not going to learn to do that overnight. There was a percussionist when I was at York University, his name, I, well, I guess I shouldn't say his name, but um, what he could do on a snare drum was incredible. And so he was trying out for the jazz band, and we thought, that's it, boys, we are done, you know, because he's coming out. Now, when he actually began to sit down on the drum set, we just had to laugh because he couldn't play it to save his life. He thought he was a percussionist, so he's doing all these fancy stuff but he couldn't keep pace with the rhythm. No rhythm at all. Again, this is a distinction that every drummer and every percussionist knows and understands. The drum set is unique. It was solely designed to play rock or jazz. According to Mickey Hart, longtime drummer for the group The Grateful Dead, the origin and development of the trap set rivals that of the Model T. The point is that this is a unique instrument not to be confused with other drums. Just before I get into the history of the drum set, can I play, can I play this in a way that, was, uh, that, it, that um, it's not designed to be played? Well, sure. How many of you have heard Handel's Messiah before? I'd imagine quite a few of you have. OK. Now, can I use this to play Handel's Messiah? Well, sure. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Na, na, na. Na, na. No one would ever buy a drum set to play it the way I just played it right now. If I was to go to a music store around here and say, I would like to purchase a drum set, and the man would say, OK, what kind of music do you play? Well, I want to use it to accompany the Hallelujah Chorus. He'd know I'd immediately lost my mind. He'd know that I'm so far out of touch. That is not what this thing was designed to do. Can you do it? Sure. I have never, ever heard a recording of the drum set being played the way it was designed to be played that couldn't be reduced to rock or jazz. It is simply impossible. If you're using this, you are restricted to rock and jazz and its related rhythmic hybrids. That's all there is to it. You can't clean it up. A pig is unclean by its very nature. You can't feed him veggie links and then eat him. <laughs> He's unclean by nature. That's, that's the problem with this thing. Now, if I take him apart and use him as a percussionist, that's not a problem. Not a problem at all. So I'm not saying that the drum is intrinsically evil. When you combine them this way, there's only two ways you can play them. Rock, jazz, and its related hybrids. So the, 
The Bible mentions praising the Lord with symbols and, and tabrets, but it doesn't mean this. This was simply invented for rock and jazz. Now, as I get into the origins of the drum set here, I want to remind you that there are things that come out of every culture that are totally acceptable, and there are some things that are not. For instance, I come from, from a Greek background, and in, in Greece, they play the bouzouki. I don't know if you've ever heard of that instrument, but um, I can't dance, but my sister can. Just, what was it, a couple of years ago? My wife and my sister went to a wedding, and my sister told Lily Mae, look, when that thing starts playing, don't leave my side because um, I'm going to have to get out of here, and they're going to want to drag me to the, to the dance floor, and I'll, I'll be tempted to do that. You just stay right here. The only way I've heard the bouzouki played is in such a way where it makes Greek people dance. Now, I'm not going to bring that carte blanche into the worship service and say, hey, I'm Greek, I became an Adventist, and this is what we play. We're going to do it Greek style. You see what I'm saying? No, we can't I can't do that. Now, there, there are some things in Greek culture, yes, that we can bring in. No, no, no question about it. So keep that in mind as I go through some of this history. When the slave ships began plying the waters between New World and West Africa, everyone thought that they carried just strong, expendable bodies. But they were also carrying the counterplayer culture. Maybe even the mother goddess culture preserved in the form of drum rhythms that could call down the Orisha from their time to ours. That comes from Mickey Hart's book, A Journey into the, uh, I, I should say, Drumming at the Edge of Magic, A Journey into the Spirit of Percussion, page 209. These drum rhythms, he says, could call down the Orisha from their time to ours. Now, who are the Orisha? They are ancestor spirits. Spiritualism is what it is. It's, he says that the drum rhythms can call down these spirits. In the Caribbean and South America, slaves were allowed to keep their drums and thus preserve their vital connection with the Orisha. Though the sudden mingling of so many different tribes produced new variations like candomblé, santeria, and voodoo. But in North America, the slaves were not allowed to keep their drums, and they lost the means by which to keep the rhythms of their spirit world alive. And out of this severing came jazz, the blues, the backbeat, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, some of the most powerful rhythms on the planet came out of that severing. It was an attempt to get in touch. Jazz music, blues, rock and roll is an, is an attempt to get in touch with the Orisha. Mickey Hart, page 209, 210. At this point, it appears as if the spirit side does not have anything to do with jazz, blues, and rock and roll. However, as drummer Sue Greg Wilson notes, the, dr the no drumming laws were powerless to stop the spirit. He says, the only place in the West where it was decreed that Africans could not play hand drums was the one place where they came up with foot drums, tap dancing, that is. It's dancing and drumming all in one, the way playing trap drums is being a traditional drum ensemble all by yourself. See, they forbade them to play um, certain things that were uh, uh, to, to celebrate, you know, the voodoo and the santeria all uh, here. And so, when the spirit came upon them, they started dancing with their feet. Now, what does that mean to today's people? It means that into the feet is where the spirit, the African vocabulary of spirit calling went to. Ask your elders on this side of the Atlantic, the old time jazz drummers, where they got their rhythms and the answer will be as from any other African musician. Where did they get their rhythms? Just ask the elders on this side. Notice what they're going to say. They watched the people carrying the spirit, the dancers, and played what they saw coming at them. External circumstances can bust up any drum, but no one can break up the spirit that makes you dance. They saw what the dancers were doing. When the dancers, quote unquote, got the spirit, they were moving. And the drummers watched them, and that's how they developed their rhythms. And that evolved into jazz and blues and rock and roll, all grounded in the spirit. Wilson asks, why have a drum set? That, he's talking about that right there. Development of such a polyrhythmic instrument, polyrhythmic meaning many rhythms, and I demonstrated that. There are many things going on at the same time. 
Development of such a polyrhythmic is instrument is not the European way. Traditional Euro drumming is identical. 20 people playing the same pa pa pum pum or in, a scenario, or in another scenario, just one badran or tabor player. African drums play in parts that combine to make a melody just like trap set drums are played. Now, if you think this is primitive, uh, you couldn't be further from the truth. We had a drummer come in from Africa when I was at York University. He pounded out rhythms that were so complex that nobody could follow them. You see, in Africa, drums are not just used to call down the Orisha, but they're also used to communicate as well. And they communicate with these rhythms. And so we were supposed to dance according to the rhythms. So he would pound out a certain rhythm, and then when he changed it, we had to change our steps. The problem was, nobody could memorize it. It was way too complex. Jazz music is a very complex music. When I talk about jazz, I'm not approaching the subject from an aesthetic point of view because aesthetically and musically, it is very challenging, extremely challenging. And they are real musicians. There is no question about that. We're approaching it, we're approaching this from another point of view. Unfortunately, the same can't be said about rock musicians today. In the 60s and in the 70s, you could say that because they really did know how to play back then. But today, Drum machines and rhythm machines and keyboards do the work for everybody. And the music has greatly degenerated. Elvis Presley and the Beatles sound like a lullaby today, don't they? And if we introduce that into our church, that's exactly where it will head. Rock has gone through a hardening process from the days of Elvis to the rap music of today. Rap didn't start overnight. According to Wilson, it was the spirit working through African-American drummers like Baby Dodds that set the standard for drumming in the United States. As the Industrial Revolution took hold, a new soundscape was born, the auditory chaos of industrial urban noise. And it was out of this soundscape that the backbeat emerged, its first manifestations appearing in those New Orleans brass bands. African rhythms and African sensibility channeled through the unfamiliar instruments of the American marching band and in the syncopated ragtime of Scott Joplin, the front line of these bands consisted of trumpet, clarinet, trombone, but sitting in the back propelling this new beat was an invention to my mind that to my mind rivals those of Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. I speak, of course, of the drum set, and that's Mickey Hart in his book, Drumming at the Edge of Magic. I didn't make these things up. Everything I'm presenting to you comes as a testimony and research from other drummers who are not even Christians. They're simply compiling the historical information. Therefore, according to Hart, the backbeat, which is your basic rock rhythm, grew out of African rhythms and African sensibility. Thus, there's not only a family tie between rock, jazz, and African rhythms, but there's a spiritual unity that pervades all three rhythms as well. Mickey Hart says this, the specifics of the West African rhythmic tradition were lost, except for in the secret societies that still followed voodoo. All that remained was an urge that once freed satisfied itself by creating something totally new, a polyrhythmic instrument that one person could play handily. And he's talking about the trap set, the drum set. Mickey Hart, page 2, 27. Notice I shared this quote earlier, but all these rhythms are related. You can hear soul and Latin music almost anywhere in Africa. You can hear African and West Indian music on the radio at various times in most large cities in the United States. You can sit in a bar in Ghana, Togo, or the Ivory Coast and hear music from Zaire and Congo, from Nigeria, from South Africa, from Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Colombia, and the United States. Great drummers, aficionados, and scholars can trace the rhythms of Latin dance halls of New York to Cuban and Brazilian cults and then to West Africa. John Miller Chernoff spent 10 years studying these rhythms there. And that's why I first began with rock, but then I graduated to blues and then to jazz. The rhythms became more complex as I moved in that direction, but they are related, no question about it. This is a testimony from an African drummer who came to the United States. Now I want you to notice what he says. The most important rhythms in Yoruba land are those that communicate with the Orisha. Again, in Africa, drums are used for many different settings, not just for calling down the Orisha, but for all forms of communication. 
he says the most important rhythms are those that communicate with the Orisha. When I got to college, he's talking about coming to the United States now, and first turned on the radio and heard when I love my baby, every time it rains I think of you and I feel blue, I was so stunned. Why was he stunned? I remember thinking, hey, that's African music. It sounds like what's at home. And the same thing happened when I heard gospel music, so I joined the campus jazz combo. That brother had never heard that music before. But when he turned that radio on and heard it for the first time, he said, it's rhythmically related to what I know at home. Historians have all confirmed everything that I've been saying to you today. The most important rhythms, the ones that communicate with the Orisha, with ancestor spirits. Thus, the same rhythms that were used to communicate with the Orisha can now be found in jazz, blues, and 50s music, which is the beginning of rock music. And so the spirit lives on and is a vital part of rock music today and of the trap set in particular. This is clear in Mickey Hart's testimony. He says, it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment when I awoke to the fact that my tradition, rock and roll, did have a spirit side that there was a branch of the family that had maintained the ancient connection between the drum and the gods. I suppose it was a little like meeting some long lost cousins and realizing with a start that these are your relatives, that you are rhythmically related, and in drumming, that's the same as blood. So the drum set can only be used to play rock and jazz and its related hybrids. So if the drum set is being used, you have communication with the Orisha. That's what these folk are telling us. I want to talk a little bit about um, syncopation. Have you ever heard that word before? Syncopation? What is it that makes something syncopated? Well, I can, if I can demonstrate here, there are some forms of music like in classical Western music that can be syncopated, but it's different from the syncopation that you find when you play rock and jazz music. Rock and jazz music is entirely built on syncopated rhythms. These are rhythms that emphasize the weakest beats in a, in, in a measure. Usually most music is in what we call 4-4 four, four time. And so syncopated rhythms that come from jazz and rock are constantly emphasizing the second and fourth beats, or in some rock rhythms, the third beat. And so, I don't know what happened to my other, I, I, now I gotta use these sticks now, but uh, the emphasis as I play these rhythms is on two and four. So it sounds, it sounds something like this. If you can count one, two, three, four. It's very hard to walk to that. How can you tell whether rhythms are syncopated or not? Try to walk to that. I dare anybody to walk to that. If I keep playing long enough, you're going to be going like this. <laughs> I was doing that in one place, and the one brother said, you know, when you started to play those drums, my head started moving. And then he stopped his head, and then his shoulders started moving. He had to stop his shoulder, and then his foot started moving. So if I go on for about five minutes, you are completely in my power. And there's nothing you can do about it unless you learn to sing Jesus Loves You and counter that rhythm. Nothing you can do about it. If you stay there, you're brought under its influence. So syncopated music, when it comes to rock, when it comes to rock emphasizes the second and the fourth beats. In jazz... Jazz does not strive for any regularity whatsoever. Jazz musicians hardly emphasize any of what we call the downbeats, beats one, two, three, and four, but they're constantly emphasizing the offbeats all the time. They can do this so well, they can play a song that's 32 measures long and hardly ever hit a downbeat. And 32 measures later, they will come, piano, guitar, and bass, and hit an amazing downbeat to create this sense of tension and release. 
it's totally syncopated. And what it does is it creates within your body a fight or flight syndrome. Again, one way you can tell if it's syncopated is, is, if, you can, is if you can walk to it. Can you walk to this? Yes, you can. One, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and... That's where the emphasis on, is on. It's on beats one and three. You can't walk to the rock rhythm. You can't walk as naturally as I just did. That is one way to tell whether it's syncopated or not. Now, rock music, or the drum set, can entirely change the flavor of, of uh, the hymn or the religious music that is being played. So go ahead and tell me what song I'm playing. Does anybody know the name of that song? I always get some creative answers when I, when I say that. But uh, my wife will accompany me and then we will, uh, we will go ahead and sing that song. Now, if you can look up for me, uh, no, I can't do that because I'll give it away. All right. Uh, dear, if you could look up where that, where, where that hymn is so that when we sing it the right way, I'll have, I'll have the words to it. So, okay, she's just as stumped as I am. All right. Well, okay. Well, we can't give you the title because it's going to give it away. So, all right, ready? Now, those of you that know the song, we're going to sing it again because I want to delete what was just presented on your hard drive. So, it's love that makes us happy. So, if you know the song, uh, just go ahead and sing. And I want you to keep in mind the difference between how she just played it and how she's going to play it now. So, go ahead, dear. It's love. she was playing along with me, she was more or less sucked into this black hole. There was nothing that she could do to break from it because I'm going to keep that time whether she does it or not. And so she has to match with me. And so the very, the very little subtle things she does, they begin to change because she must match what I'm playing. When she played by herself here without me accompanying, she was a little more freer rhythmically. So. And if I was to march it out, tis love that makes us happy, tis one and two and three and four, one and two and three and four, and one and two and three and four. And That's the way she was playing it. But when I began to play, I kind of turned that upside down. It was very hard. It was very hard to, uh, to walk. It makes you dance, exactly. Now, the other kind of rhythm, uh, and I want you to tell me what song I'm playing right now as well. So here's another song you can, you can try to guess. Any takers on that? All right, ready, dear? One, two, three, one.
That's what you call a jazz rhythm. And so that's located in your hymnals in 337, 338. So let's just sing one stanza of that so we can delete the other one. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, His child and forever I am. Again, there was a major difference there as well. She was free to speed up, she was free to slow down, but um, again, uh, even though I'm playing anything but a downbeat at times, that, 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 that's going through my head. And that's driving me, and it's driving her as well, and we need to match up with it. So once I take that grit away, she is a lot more free to play the way it was designed to be played. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. If you have been blessed by this media, you may want to consider a donation to help support our efforts to spread these important and timely messages. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our media center at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, that's A-D-A, -A, Michigan, 49. 301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media for free at our online media center at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.